Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special Vice Chancellor's Talk with Dr. Adrian Chen. My name's Helen. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the College, and I'll be taking us through some housekeeping points before we get underway. This will be the sixth installment of the Vice Chancellor's Talks, sharing the experience and knowledge of some of the most influential names in art and design and bringing together the RCA's global community. Just some housekeeping, we are recording this event and a copy of it will be available for all students to watch again on Moodle afterwards. Questions have been submitted in advance, so we will not be using the raise hand function during this event. I'm now delighted to introduce the RCA's Vice Chancellor, Dr. Paul Thompson, to commence this evening's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, from around the world for, um, for, for, this, for this talk. My name is Paul Thompson. I'm Vice Chancellor at the RCA. Um, and I'm really delighted to welcome um, Dr. Adrian Cheng, who is, uh, is going to be in discussion with Dr. Adrian Lahoud, uh, another Adrian, who is our Dean of the School of Architecture here at the RCA. Um, I'm going to say a few words about Adrian and his, and his background um, for, for, for those of you who perhaps um, need, uh, need to know a little bit more about the, the kind of the very, very broad span of his interests um, and experience. He's a cultural entrepreneur and a businessman and an arts patron. Uh, and those of you who follow his wonderfully visual uh, Instagram account will also know um, that uh, above all, he describes himself as a dreamer. In 2008, Adrian founded K11, the world's first art mall, with a focus on developing and delivering a journey of imagination for customers through seamless integration of core themes, art, people, and nature. From this came K11 Art Foundation in 2010, which supports contemporary Chinese art and public art education programs, as well as offering international scholarships and hosting exhibitions around the world. He's, he is Executive Vice Chair and CEO of the New World Development, which is a real estate um, company. Uh, he's Executive Director of Chow Tai Fook Jewelry Group, uh, and he's Chairman of the New World Group Charity Foundation Limited, and a Director uh, of a number of the other group's subsidiaries. He was the driving force behind K11 Museum, which is a groundbreaking cultural retail complex, also known as, and I love this expression here, the Silicon Valley of Culture, which was shaped by 100 creative powers and opened in 2019 in the old Victoria Docklands area of Hong Kong, um, which has become rapidly the art and design district of, of Hong Kong. The complex includes a multi-purpose cultural space spanning 10,000 square meters, the K11 Art and Cultural Center and K11 Sculpture Park on the sixth floor, which feature a really inspiring collection of international artworks. Um, and Adrian was very keen to make um, a strong visual statement um, about merging a disciplines on the bridge architecture, urbanism, landscape, and public space. Just recently, K11 Museum showcased a fleet of um, deep sanitation robots um, utilizing design and technology to help the ongoing combat with COVID, which just sounds an, an intriguing uh, a sight, the thought of these robots um, scrubbing, uh, scrubbing off uh, this wretched virus. I think we could do with them here in London, certainly at the moment. Um, all of these, uh, these, these accolades uh, uh, and, and, and roles, being a trustee of the Royal Academy of the Arts here in London, he's, a visiting, he's on the visiting committee of the Met Museum in New York, he's a member of Tate's Asia Pacific Acquisitions Committee and a member of the International Circle of the Centre Pompidou. Um, he really is um, very much a global citizen and for that, it's fair to say, I'll review very, very um, wisely um, classified him as one of the power 100 uh, in the art world, um, which uh, I think is, 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 is not at all a surprise. So Adrian, um, it's afternoon here in London. I'm guessing it's the evening there in, uh, in Hong Kong, if that's where you're, you are. Um, thank you very much indeed for um, joining us today and for uh, joining a conversation with Adrian Lahoud, um, uh, who, as I said, is the, the Dean of the School of Architecture here at RCA. Thank you. So welcome, Adrian. It's really terrific to get a chance to have this discussion. Good evening. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. 
Yeah. Um, and I, I thought I should start because it's been such a, um, a difficult year. Um, just to see how you're going. How, how are you coping? How's the last year been for you? Uh, it has to be very reflective, you know, you know working from home. And um, there's a lot of, you know, in fact, it's, it's good to detox uh, a lot of, uh, you know, ideas and thoughts and really make it um, happen. Actually, I was very, it was very fruitful last year because of the COVID, because we were able to um, create a lot of um, um, urgency in, in implementing a lot of uh, social innovative types of ino ino ini ini uh, initiatives as well. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was actually quite productive. Um, and ironically, I thought it was a time for us to uh, really think and uh, rethink about um, what innovation means. Amazing. And I, I also noticed, and Paul mentioned this a little bit in the introduction, that um, you've also been quite supportive and involved in some of the public health initiatives in, in Hong Kong. Could you say a few words about that? Uh, yes. So um, last year during, uh, during COVID, um, we actually, so, so, you know, as Paul was introducing me, I was, my company is actually a real estate company, a conglomerate, which we provide um, different services and also uh, like healthcare services, uh, retail service, uh, 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 hospitality, like the Rosewood hotels, and also we build apartments. So we basically focus on an ecosystem that surrounds um, a person, uh, a, a human uh wellness so the wellness of it is, is everyone's uh, priority and what we did last year was setting up four production lines in making affordable medical grade face masks hmm. so from a real estate company we becomes a face mask company uh, for charity and um, the first batch was donated to global populations in need and we even installed touchless dispensers in hong kong to give different ngo centers and neighborhoods to access to these masks and for every box we sell, we donate one box to, uh, to charities as well. So uh, we're able to, to, to really create a shared value with society and really um, resolve some of the problems. Because at that time, during February, March, and April, um, a lot of, uh, there was a shortage of, of masks, as all of you know, and even in Hong Kong uh, and in Asia. So we were able to set up the production line in just two months and we were able to produce 7 million of masks per month. And it was all uh, distributed um, to all uh, low income families mm. um, and, uh, and working with around 20 NGO centers. And we have 35 dispensers where people can collect their masks through a scan code. That's quite extraordinary. You know, um, you, you, you touched on this just before, but I think, you know, because of the confinement that we've all been in um uh, and it has it has also been an opportunity for for self-reflection and for really i think at least for for all of us in some way it's prompted a kind of uh, a set of deeper questions we're asking ourselves you know what what is our mission what are we doing um and i wonder i wonder if it's prompted those kinds of those kinds of questions and 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 what kinds of answers are emerging off off the back of the year for you um i think a very big answer was to make everything simple mm. and uh, also to contemplate and do less. I, 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 we were, I was, you know, running a big marathon for the past few decades and there were the priorities. I think everything becomes more complicated. So I think simplicity is something that we want to focus. The idea of focusing on uh, and focusing and also aligning is something that we're looking at. So these are adjectives that's always um, in my head. There's also one slogan that came up very uh, every month. Basically, I was telling all my teams that people see crisis, we see opportunities. Mm -hmm. So the positivity uh, uh, kind of attitude is very important uh, in our um, uh, in our entity in our firm. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also being ambitious too, because we see opportunity and we can, we should be uh, ambitious. So this kind of a more contradictory uh, way of looking at uh, COVID becomes um, a driving force and impetus for us to uh, actually grow. Mm -hmm. So our, our morale for the staff, um, the, the company is actually growing larger and bigger than any normal years. Right. Wow. Okay. Incredible. Um, and, and how do you see the landscape of like arts and culture 
shifting or and you know you talked about alignments but how do you how do you see what are the main shifts that will come out of of this last year do you think i think there's a big phenomenon a paradigm shift that uh, people are much more into the digital world so you can see that all the digital art assets the non uh, the ng uh, the nft nft uh, are coming up the reason why is our people are stuck at home you're looking at the computer they're, they're so used to it already. For those people who are not used to the computer, they're used to the computer because we're doing Zoom as well too, like now. Yeah, yeah. So digital assets, digital art assets, I think would be a very big trend, number one. Secondly, I think people are dying to be innovative. Yeah. People are dying to be creative. They're, people are trying to, because you can't socialize. So you're either talking to yourself or you're actually watching Netflix or, uh, yeah. or Korea, some Korean dramas, but you're, you're actually dreaming. So, you know, in Instagram uh, um, um, account, I call myself a dreamer because you need to dream. You need to have a aspiration. You need to have hope. And the more you have, the more you dream, you look at, you, you, will, you, would, you would daze and you will, you will have times when you just kind of, you know, doze off and, yeah. uh, and think about something else. But, in, but before, before pre-COVID, where you're spending a lot of time on your work, on your task. And then you go back, you, and then you eat, you sleep, you go to work, you meet your right. friends. It's a, for now, you can actually dream. Mm. So you have more time to dream. And I think that's good. And that would stimulate a lot of uh, great creativity and also innovation. I mean, I think that's an incredible idea, you know, that, that actually what could come off the back of this is a shift away from also just passively consuming entertainment and, and to think about people becoming creators in different kinds of ways, potentially enabled through through online platforms, um, that that feels like I feel like that's already happening in a way, yeah. So, yeah. But, but to see that flourishing would be really would be quite something. And is that is that informing the way that you're thinking about you know your own businesses over the next few years? Um, yes. Um, so we focus a lot in the idea of wellness now. Mm. So the wellness and how to really protect our um, our customers or our mm. consumers. Mm. I think that's something that we look at it from different from from the spatial point of view. Um, how do we increase outdoor space, nature? How to how to make a person well psychologically, mentally? Um, touch wood. If there's some another COVID coming up, how do we actually um, create a space that people can actually quarantine? Uh, people can actually enjoy. Mm. How do we limit noise and everything? So so the, it's more practical. You know, uh, I think it becomes a very practical. Um, in a space that we want to um, to mm. create, and <clears throat> I, I, maybe to, to to follow on from that a little bit, um, it's uh, maybe ask you a two a two part question. One is around, you know, your work is so influenced and so focused on a kind of cross cultural dimension. I think that comes through really so so powerfully, um, looking at the projects that you've been involved in. Um, and I wonder if you could say a bit about your own formation, you know, in, in terms of your family and education and, and, and why, why that perspective became so important. You know, was it to do with, you know, Hong Kong's role as a kind of crossroads and a melting pot? Um, but also, but also in the second part of the question would be, um, do you see that changing you know, or do you see that, do you, what do you see as the impact of, of not being able to travel as easily potentially as, as, as we could have before on that, on that, on the importance of that cross-cultural aspect in, um, in your own practice? Um, that's a good question. Um, so how, how does, you know, I was formed by, um, I think I, there was a lot of cross-pollination and cross-cultural um, kinds of uh, intersections in my, uh, when I was younger. So I studied in Hong Kong in a very local Chinese school. Then I went to uh, a Taft, uh, American boarding school. Then I graduated from Harvard. But the last year of Harvard, I went to Kyoto to study Japanese art and culture. Okay. But then, then I went back to uh, investment banking to learn, to learn about businesses for three, four years. Okay. And then I went to China to, uh, in Beijing for two years to okay. work. But at that time, I was very exposed to the contemporary Chinese art yeah. as well. But in, at Harvard, I study uh, humanities, and in high school, I was trained as a tenor with a classical training uh, uh, curriculum. Mm. So I was all over the place, you know, even you know, in my skill sets, in my uh, acad academia, or p places that I've traveled. Uh, and those are actually very uh, are seeds that have um, cemented 
in my entire formation of, of, of K11, how we, I want everyone to be accessible to art design and culture. And bear in mind, uh, you know, in, in, the, in 2008, you know, at that time in, contem in, in China, they don't, you know, art is, they don't have the idea of what the word art because art is art gallery or art museums, mm -hmm. but art is not for everyone. You know, you don't, you're not, it's not that accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that we should all, everyone should embrace it. So as a result, um, what I did was to merge um, the contemporary art, the design part into a place where there's a lot of traffic and everyone goes. Mm -hmm. And that's a shopping mall. Mm. And at that time in 2008, everyone goes to the shopping mall. So there's so high traffic, everyone, everyone goes as a, as a daily lifestyle. And I'm trying to, so, so my mission is to enrich them. Power of innovation, uh, culture and creativity. And if I just open an art gallery, there would not be anyone going. So this was a very new model that is a little bit socially innovative and at that time, all the rent that I, I, I collected, uh, one or two percent will be um, donated to my uh, art foundation, which I, I created in 2010. Mm -hmm. And the K11 Art uh, Foundation, which was a, cha um, a nonprofit organization, we started to work with uh, foreign uh, entities, foreign uh, museums, uh, foreign uh, art institutions. The first one was Palais de Tokyo. We did the first group contemporary Chinese art show in Palais de Tokyo. And then I toured it back to uh, China, created an uh, art village uh, and also op and open museums also in China as well, next to my um, uh, retail spaces. So it became a very interesting model because it becomes a place where you can actually enjoy your, your, your buy your daily goods, enjoy, uh, and at the same time, enjoy art. So it becomes a new curated experience and journey for um, people in Asia. Incredible. Um, and, and the question of heritage has been something that's been really important for you as well. Um, uh, and, and, you know, not just in terms of, um, you know, uh, craft um, or, or, or manufacturing, but also in terms of architecture. Um, and, and, you know, you've, you've been really heavily involved in also helping to stimulate and protect creative industries. Um, uh, I wonder if you could say a few words about, about that work. So um, th 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 just two parts to this. First is two years ago, I set up the first K-11 Craft and Guild Foundation. Mm -hmm. The Craft and Guild Foundation is to preserve and conserve uh, fast disappearing Chinese craft and guild and art, um, um, you know, artisanal types of uh, yep. crafts. And uh, so for one is called um, Bai Bao Xian. Bai Bao Xian is like cloisonne, but it's basically precious stones, okay. but inlay on into woods, into oh. cabinets, wooden yep. cabinets. Amazing. We also have uh, Luo Dian, which is like coromandel. You know, it's like uh, mother of pearl into wood, kind of little, little jewelry boxes. We also have Guang Chai, which is like a hand painted types of on porcelains. So it's a colorful paint painting on porcelains. Incredible. Um, these are all, yeah. Uh, and then we also have an architecture, uh, ar uh, archi architecture technique called Ningbo architecture technique, which is beautiful. And I right. discovered this, and Ningbo is a place near Shanghai. It's a second tier city near Shanghai. And yeah. for some reason they have this architectural technique on the, on the, uh, on the rooftop. And it's like a dome, it's like a dome. It's mm -hmm. similar to a, I don't know about, it. it's like a Marrakesh kind of those dome, that's to mm -hmm. those techniques, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a very interesting, uh, it's like a temple technique on the rooftop. And oh. uh, we're pre preserving that. So I'm going to recreate using those techniques. I'm going to put it in all my projects in Nimbo. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, so As a, way of, a, way, a way of creating work for, 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 the, for the craftsman. Yes, exactly. So I'll give you an example, Bai Bao Xian, which is uh, the, the pressure stones inlay into wooden cabinets. We, we only have 30 artisans in the world. And last year, there's only, there's, there was 130. So 100 disappeared. Some mm. died, some quit the job because they, they don't have the demand. Yeah. Got be, before, people need to buy them for gifts, you need to support them. But now there's no one is supporting them. So yeah. we are supporting them now. Yeah. So this is a very preservation of the artisans, of document, documentation of their techniques, the procedures, 
but also the videos as well. And I think that's that's very important to be a, to have an institutionalized uh, way yes. to preserve these fast disappearing um, uh, artifacts, uh, mm. not artifacts, uh, artisanal techniques. Mm. Um, and and back to your question of during COVID, um, mm. another thing that I felt very strongly was nostalgia. So for some being, I became so nostalgic that I became I became so into uh, preserving heritage. I thought that it's it just resonates to me so much. And I came across a project called a State Theater, which is a 58 years old uh, theater in Hong Kong, mm. which uh, was a first uh, in Hong Kong as the number one as a great historical site. And, and so we decided to preserve it. And I hired a team in London, Wilkins and I, Purcell, to help me to, uh, to figure out a way to preserve the entire theater. Uh, and that becomes a very, very, for some reason, it becomes a talk of the entire Asia, you know, because I think during COVID, everyone was so bored, either watching dramas and suddenly someone who's out there preserving heritage. Yeah. Uh, and everyone was happy and very, was enjoy because they thought this is hope, you know, we're preserving our own identity with preserving some values, you know, core values. So, um, so this becomes a very exciting project. And, um, and we're doing a big exhibition now in March, if you come to Hong Kong by any chance, um, we, before, we, we, before we try to um, redesign it, um, we are going to open up the the decadence of that project, because that project is very interesting. It used to be called the Little Shanghai. Right. And people come from Shanghai and they stationed there around that district. And that theater was the place for all the international concerts, sound right. of music shows during the 50s and the 60s in Hong Kong. You need to understand 50s and 60s in Hong Kong, there's not a lot of venues where you can actually right. host these kind of plays and musicals. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, uh, and it was founded by a uh, Englishman and, um, and they had a beautiful um, exoskeleton structure on top, which was also done by a structural engineer in the 50s. Yeah. But the reason for the problem is that they did not document anything. So we were not able to find any archives about it. We can only uh, find something from the newspapers and mm. we can't even find the designers' names or the structural mm. engineer, engineering mm. names. Mm. So that's why we, th we thought, you know, heritage is so important because it really kind of, um, uh, signifies the, the glories at the ups and downs of, of the history of, of the city. And then in the 90s, unfortunately, this theater was so run down, it became a, a, um, a soft, soft porn uh, cinema. So you can see that it was used to be so glamorous. They had the Ritz ballroom inside. People were having ballroom dancing parties. But then in the 90s, it becomes a, a, um, a, a quite a decadent uh, a theater. So I thought the history was um, was amazing. So we uh, we are starting to do exhibitions now, and then uh, by 2025, we're going to open reopen it. Oh, that's that's incredible. You know, the thing I love the most about Hong Kong is that kind of coexistence of. Uh, it seems like the most incredible, like heritage building fabric, a very strong intergenerational sense of living as well. I never, you know, never forget being in the park in Mong Kok and people doing Qigong at five in the morning. And, you know, that that it was always intention with the fast pace of development in the city. So it's really so wonderful to hear you um, to hear you describe the, um, the these, these kinds of projects in that city, because I think they're just absolutely they're fundamental to its character, you know. Um, but but I would like to keep asking questions. But Lottie's telling me that I need to hand over to the students because there is quite a few people who've who've also um, who who are uh, who would like to ask you some questions as well. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, the first person to come on um, to come onto the Zoom to ask you a question. Um, his name is Andrew Onre. Uh, he's an architecture and interior design graduate um, from his, in 1995. He's in Christchurch, and I'll quickly read his bio um, while he's brought up online. Um, Andrew Onre is an innovative brand creative director within the luxury tourism, retail, fashion, hotel, and spa sectors. Um, 20 years of conceiving, developing, and executing award-winning new built projects, including the Crown Plaza London Battersea, Relais, uh, Chateau Maison, both in New York and London, and over a dozen standalone um, new build spas. Um, welcome, Andrew. Hello, um, and thank you very much for your talk. It's been um, brilliant. Um, it, here in the UK, um, obviously the high streets have been ailing for many, many years. 
So uh, really with what um, you've been doing in Hong Kong and is really um, how can we revitalize the high streets here with artisan based programs? Um, well, thank you for this you know, thoughtful question. I know exactly um, you know, what you're talking about. I think um, when you look at the problem of our high streets is that people use, used to shop, you know, and the shopping habits have changed. And I think th there's a problem because we, people are shopping for fashion. People can, there's a lot of ways people can shop. You can, you can shop online. There's a lot of competition and you basically divert the traffic to other places. Um, and the market towns where these high streets are, are have a different kind of population also with a different kind of lifestyle from before. So, you know, I'm not the expert of, of, how, of high streets because um, in, in uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, different paradigm shift that was happening at that time. But some of the older shops have not moved with the times and are no longer competitive. Mm. So what I would suggest is that the first thing is to first change the trade mix. So there's two parts to it. One is the artisanal programs that we can put into it. The other is the trade mix of what the high street should be, right? Because some of them are basically obsolete um, and we're com very competitive. Uh, those that are competitive have developed an online business as well. So uh, they no longer need to be renting space uh, on the high street. So that's why high streets are disappearing. Um, perhaps, you know, I think high street now need to be more a gathering space rather than a shopping space. So the, the definition for a high street should not be people going for shopping fashion because there's too many outlets that we can do fashion, but a place where we can actually gather and learn. So a space where we can actually accumulate, um, uh, you know, knowledge capital. People can create a community that people can actually share knowledge, a forum kind of types of, of places, um, and places where we can have coffees, you know, I think restaurants, coffee shops, places we can uh, gather will be good. If you want to do fashion, I think you need to be, instead of having some mom and pop, old fashioned types that are not competitive enough, you need to have the O2O, you need to have the online kind of segment to it to make it more relevant to, to today's um, time. And for artisanal communities that we build, you know, I think the, the, it should be a place where we should be learning about um, a culture and also uh, things that are much more um, open. Um, so I think, you know, we can have some creative solutions to see um, whether we can actually revamp it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'd like to introduce um, our next, next um, question. Um, Kwang Kyu Lung, um, a critical and historical studies for 2019, uh, who's located in Oxford. Um, Kwang Kyu Lung is a Chinese British artist and art historian originally from Hong Kong, finished her doctorate without corrections in 2018 at the RCA. Uh, the book from her thesis will be published by De Goita Publishers in 2021. Um, she's now painting and writing in her own time during lockdown. Kwang Kyu, welcome. Oh, I think you're muted. You might want to unmute. Let's see. Well, there you go. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for the talk, Adrian. Adrian, um, I've enjoyed it and I'm inspired. And I have a question. Thank you. Um, what inspired you? Your you, what inspired your idea or passion of philosophy behind creating artisanal communities? I know you've mentioned some of it at the talk. You know, the, the, the artisanal uh, movement, it's, it's, it's like a cultural vision, a philosophy uh, for living. So you think about it, you know, in the old days, in the age of machines, we want to celebrate something more human I know, and kindle the artisan's uh, spirit in us. And, and I think everyone is an artisan. We are creators on its own. We just forgot, we just forget that we are basically creators. We can actually create and craft things. Um, we can imagine, we can create, we can dream, but we can also make things. Okay, the maker program is important. You can, we can be educated and we can make. So we are going back to something, as I said, simplicity, something going back to the basics. But people don't remember because why? Because we're always on Instagram. We're always typing. We're always, we're doing, we're always, always busy with other things. And because we're, so we, I want to go back to a very human, um, uh, you know, types of uh, human centric, types of philosophies that we can collect, connect, and collide. 
and we becomes and the artisanal movement becomes an incubator for ideas and a channel for audience to experience them. So, you know, artisan, as you know, means a skilled craft worker who mix or create uh, material objects, you know, entirely by hand. Um, and the concept is very old, you know, one sees it in many ancient uh, civilization in ancient China, ancient India, ancient Greece. Uh, and, but Asians work, you know, artisans work from their studios. You know, they're very specific. They don't work for everyone, but they work, they work in the studios and, and they were clustered around central public space too. Mm -hmm. So they're always in the middle of the public. They've been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. And these were artisanal communities, right? Think about it, in a very central public space, they will always have artists in studios. And so they've been part of the public and the mass for so many years, so many, a long, long time. So, the, so today the adjective artis artisanal is often used to differentiate, you know, hard hand processing to industrial production. But, you know, in recent decades, cities in Asia have experienced tremendous growth in urbanization and also the changing habits and consumptions in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, people start to go back to artisanal products and, artis and artisans again, because people have been so industrious for the past decades. So it's, it's like a cycle coming back to something more human, right? Uh, and, and I felt that this quest for the artisanal need not be limited to consumption. It should be an essential attitude to life. So as a result, it should infuse in art, architecture, attitudes, lifestyle, designs. Um, and that's why my advocacy began here and artisanal, artis artisanal movement was born. Um, it's not something very lofty. It's something very, you know, basic, accessible to every person. So for example, in K-11 Musea, when I asked, you know, 100 designers, architects, craftsmen, artists to create um, my K-11 Musea, K-11 Atelier along the Victoria Dock site, we immediately creating this artisanal community, like an alumni club that we, we gather, we have Zooms, we have webinar all the times um, and created this uh, near the waterfront, an uh, open space that are accessible to the general public free of charge. Um, and so this general public are the beneficiaries of this piece of artisanal architecture. And by visiting, uh, you enjoy the art, you enjoy all the um, um, intangible kind of um, experience of it, uh, benefiting the entire community. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now invite Laren Lee, who's a PhD uh, from the history, has a PhD from the history of design. Um, she's based in London. Um, uh, Laren Lee is currently a PhD student, sorry, in the history of design at the Royal College of Art, working on Japanese mending culture and contemporary fashion theory. Prior to her studies in London, she, um, prior to her studies in London, she received a master's of art degree in fashion studies um, from Parsons School of Design. Her research concentrates on subculture studies, creative industries in Asia, and contemporary Chinese fashion in the context of material culture and visual culture studies. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks for coming to RCA virtually. Um, I know that New World Development has been devoting considerable time and resources to promote creating shared value. And I wonder what you identify as crucial social issues in the post-COVID time and how would you or new world development react to these changes and keep a good balance between art and business? Um, I think that's a good question. And first, first of all, you know, the global pandemic has made you know, wellness everyone's priority. So to be well is something very important. And the safety of our staff, safety of our customers are really our priority. So being well is something that we want to create. And creating shared value is to drive social progress through our business oper operations. We have set our minds to turn this public health crisis into an opportunity for uh, innovation and growth to better serve our stakeholders. So for example, as I mentioned, the four production lines that uh, for making affordable medical grade face masks is one example. We also are building upon our global leadership in certified well buildings, well, well buildings to keep our customers safe by using more healthy building materials, touchless features, and also robots to disinfect our sites and keep our customers very safe. 
Um, I think secondly, locking down during uh, COVID has created, has created an urge for people to connect and try new experiences, as I mentioned before, mm. without needing to tra travel. So mm. since early 2020, we've made K-11 Art Foundation exhibitions, all my property show suites, and even shopping virtual. Um, and I think it's not going to be during, only during COVID, but I think it's going to be a long-term thing. Uh, we're going to, we, even for shopping, we're going to go through live streaming. We don't need to actually go to physical spaces anymore. That shifts our, our entire business perspective on, the, on how we look at the future um, and how, you know, how KLM has transformed itself from a retail brand to a lifestyle content platform with a seamless online to offline transition. We're actually like a, K11 would become a content platform, meaning like a media platform, where we're going to collaborate and become a video platform. So we're not going to, this actually trans come from the COVID. This actually changes us the way we think. And we've worked with our partners in art and luxury retail to create online shows and collections for our customers' enjoyment and convenience. You know, last but not least, you know, COVID has put many people out of jobs, given our group's latest whole city redevelopment projects in mainland China and heritage conservation efforts at the State Theatre in Hong Kong. So we're looking for talents, you know, to support our business growth and, pres and preserve the art and culture of these sites. Um, so uh, we are also capturing ESG market as, as well to attract more talents to join our existing team and drive impact through our businesses. So last week, I did a big job there to create 1,000 new jobs um, for, 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 for Hong Kong. And, uh, and there's actually 10,000 applications because I don't know if people know in Hong Kong, it was, it's now the highest unemployment rate right now. It's around, I think 7% for the, it's the highest for the past 23 years. Mm. Um, so um, these are kind of efforts that not only react to, but come out stronger from the COVID crisis. Thanks. I, I, I saw you post this uh, recruiting program on your social media. I was quite jealous. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laren. Um, Thank you, Adrian. Uh, I'd like to introduce Roxy Tang. Um, Roxy has worked in galleries in Shanghai and London. She's currently keen on exploring the relationship between individual producers and contemporary systems. Um, and she's from the Curating Contemporary Art Program um, in the second year. Roxy, um, hello, how are you? Welcome. Hi. Um, thank you, Adrian. And it's really impressive to know the Little Shanghai project in um, in advance and look forward to its loading. And here's my question. As a place gathering people to discover and learn art and culture, how do you expect the connection between exhibitions and projects in EK11 and maybe the general development of contemporary art context and the K11 business model? Thank you. Um, the idea of K11 brand is that art infuses all life. So uh, if you look at K11 Museum, art, including contemporary art, is part of everyone's daily lives. So it's, um, it's an amalgam of an aesthetic and a consumption enjoyment. Um, so business and art help each other and with the citizens as the ultimate beneficiaries. So I think in the future, I think um, for, for all the art exhibitions, it will be a very omni-channel, which means an online and offline types of curation. So maybe in the future, what we need to do is having a lot of knowledge capital online to teach um, art, but at the same time, we have exhibition offline, but then we're also going to have virtual exhibition all intertwined together to create this kind of omni-channel. Uh, I think that will be a very big uh, a trend. Secondly, I think, as I said, digital assets is something that will be also a big paradigm shift coming across as well. But I think, you know, for K11 Art Foundation, um, we have no boundaries. So as long as it's, uh, but lately we add the heritage part to it. So, uh, and also the craft and guild part to it. So I think that will be quite an interesting thing too. How art, how heritage, how, um, how craft and guild can all intertwine and, and it becomes a new curatorial direction. Yeah, thank you for answering. And thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Roxy. Um, thank you. So um, now to round off the event, um, I'd love to introduce 
our final guest, Thomas Heatherwick, um, and an RCA alumnus, and who is someone who's been described as one of Britain's most significant designers. Thomas graduated um, from the RCA in 1994 from the Furniture MA program. Um, shortly after, he established Thomas Heatherwick Studio, now the Heatherwick Studio. And over the last 18 years, he and a group of fellow designers, architects, and engineers have worked on nearly 200 projects. He's recognized globally for his work in architecture, sculpture, and design, the most notable projects, including Google's California headquarters, the 2012 Olympic Cauldron, the UK Pavilion at the 2010 Shanghai Expo, and the new London Routemaster. Thomas, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, Adrian, it's brilliant, brilliant to talk to you again. I don't think I've got any good killer question for you because um, I, I really, um, I just remember when meeting you 15 years ago and we, and you showed me what in Kowloon, what you were doing and it was really early stages. And I remember thinking, oh, this, oh, oh, wait, you know, what, what's this? And I was just starting to really learn myself really how it, particularly uh, in the West, we've got scared of making public space. And so shopping environments are the public space. I mean, I think after the Second World War, after sort of pretty disastrous public space making, it got left to property developers to make the public space often where people come together. And, and you, were, you were already like testing and trying ideas. And then uh, it must be now about eight, eight, nine years ago, I went to, um, and we bumped into each other at different points. And uh, yes. we, I then went to Shanghai and I saw what you were doing there. I walked into a um, into the K11 in Shanghai that was quite newly created. And there was, I was indoors, there was a lawn, a grass lawn. There were the most extraordinary mushrooms growing behind a glass wall that were sculpturally, you know, it, the, incredible looking things to see but they're all growing so this room was alive with growing mushrooms and they were for sale I think as well and they told <laughs> me a cow they said the cow had been there last week on the lawn and and I really you know I took my hat off to you I just thought you know for carrying through and you were really making something and I suppose my badly framed question is about emotion and uh, I I've learned from property developers in, in, in design and architecture, often it's very cerebral, it's conceptual, it's kind of very, very much led by the brain. And I think my biggest learnings and, and property developers such as you have helped me to learn this is that emotional <laughs> function, you know, the logic was form followed function, but I don't think there's been enough acknowledgement of emotion as a function. And I remember even hearing how um, speaking to the great grandson of the founder of Harley Davidson, and he was saying how Willie Davidson, you know, original, had always said, form follows function, but both report to emotion. Uh, and so I, I suppose I'd love to hear you. You, you spoke about hum, human, human centric, human design. I'd love to hear more about how you think about, well, I wanted to say, bravo. I love, I love the things you've been doing have been amazing. And I also just wanted to hear you talk about emotion really, because that, that seemed to be something that you've focused on, understood before many other people. And whether we call it art or creativity or heritage, or something, I feel it's all circled around you seeing emotion as a thing to, to, that wasn't being addressed enough by other people. Yo, thank you, thank you, Thomas. Thank you so much for your kind words. And I do miss our very interesting conversations that we did in Hong Kong and also in London. Um, I hope we can actually have more interactions uh, when, when the border opens back. Um, so your question is emotions. I, I think this is such a great question because when you're creating anything, spaces or anything working with humans, it's all about emotions, right? Um, and when I was starting K11, um, the word that I wrote was not only to stimulate the five senses, but actually to create a childlike emotion. 
So I want everyone to have this emotions of when you're like a child, because that's the most, when you're a child, you're the most creative person. You're the most imaginative person. You can actually dream and you're the most genuine and most authentic to yourself. And this is exactly that I want to go back. I, I want to create in the journey of imagination. This is our vision for K11. And this journey that I curated, we, we want to have touching points that people can come and to, to, to go back to nature. But the nature and the word child childlike or being ch a child, it's similar. Because when you're a child, you would love to go to, the na to nature. You, want, you would love to go to the farm because that is the most simple and most basic as a human, per a human, human being. So the latest project that I did was actually creating a farm inside a residential project called the Pavilia Farm. <laughs> <laughs> so I created a, I actually created a farm that was inside a big compl a residential complex and the farm was 200,000 square feet. So you can actually do, but then I added another aspect to it. I, I added hydroponic and aquaponic and a real farm to it. The only difference is that they, we do not have any cows or sheep or goats. <laughs> you know, that's all because of the rules in Hong Kong. Um, but you can imagine that the sheep is grazing on a smallish you know, piece of grassland in an urban building, you know, with children delighting in the experience. It's really both surreal and really embodiment of what the artisanal movement means. And that actually answers the question of how do you actually get that emotion out? Because that emotion is a report to the function. That's really so interesting because I think in, in I, I love that. That's really because I think actually in the architectural world that, uh, that I'm normally finding myself, there's great snobbery actually against using words like childlike. You know, that would be a dismissive thing and complexity and almost impenetrability is often sort of celebrated and, and there. And, and I've always been interested in that emotional experience I had as a 13 year old, 14 year old going around the world wondering, why is that like that? Who did that? How's that? And then, and then finding often that the the world of the newer world of buildings left me cold, and that seemed a gap. And so it's interesting that you're you're in that. Me and my architectural team are all sort of trying to engage in that gap of the emotion and being proud to think of of the child as a good way to look at the world and not a dumbing down because actually children are super smart as well. Exactly. They're just truer to emotion often. And, and the key is to be the authenticity too because people can feel the authenticity more and that stimulates the emotion part. That will create the more emotional part. Love to see, you've managed to get away with giving a great talk without showing any visuals. I'd love to see the pictures of that <laughs> that you're talking about and things like that. that. That'd be great. Okay, so we just need borders to open up again and, and get the chance to see each other again. That would be amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank, Other Adrian thank you. As well, please. Thanks, thanks, Thomas. Um, we're, we're getting towards the end. Um, I just have like two, two more questions, really. Um, the, the first one is, what, what's the most urgent, interesting thing on your desk at the moment? What's really seizing all of your energy and, 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 and your imagination? What's keeping you up? Well, I'm building 24 projects, K11 projects in the next five years. So mm -hmm. I'm very, <laughs> there's going to be- picked one, I'm, but 24 will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, uh, yeah. So, so the thing that I think uh, matters to me a lot these days <laughs> is to um, have a project that I want to build uh, with sustainable materials um, and uh, have a commitment to, uh, to the world that I will, by 2026, um, in, in, my, in, in the greater Bay Area of, of China, I will have all renewable energy and there, there was also carbon net zero for, mm -hmm. by 2050. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so there's a lot of commitment to that and I am trying to build the most sustainable building and uh, in, in China right now. So I think it's something quite challenging at this point, uh, but I think I can tackle uh, also for materials as well. And what how do we upcycle materials? So I, uh, you know, so we, we're trying to use bamboo. We are trying to use a lot of very interesting materials and we try to use some upcycle materials. Um, so it's challenging, but it's gonna, it will be easily be resolved. 
Can I ask you what kind of building it is? I'm curious. It's a it's a it's a Hanjo. In, in Hangzhou, we have one building, um, Ningbo. We're building. Um, I think you can go, you can actually Google it. I think I have I did a public re release. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so so things that this is the the things that kind of matters to me a little bit more. Yeah, amazing. Um, and and the, then my my final question would be, um, what what kind of work do you want to be remembered for? How would you like to imagine? What would be the project that that you'd be most proud of as your legacy? If you've made it yet, it might be yet to come. I think all my projects are, are my 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 uh, my sons and daughters. You know, so it really means close to me. Um, mm. But I really want to leave a, a strong legacy for the next generation. So I think something that rel it relates to the next generation. It's something that I I think is important. I'm very into anthropology as well. So um, mm -hmm. on the history of humanity, anthropology. Mm -hmm. So any projects that relate to that and, and that can pass on to the next generation will be something that I care a lot. I, I honestly, I'm, I'm, if I have time, I would love to study anthropology. I didn't have time to study that. Me too. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I would absolutely have, I mean, half my bookshelf is anthropology. Book, I think yeah. I'm as interested in it as architect. I think you have to, you have to be a bit of an anthropologist to be a designer or an architect, no? Yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's why this is something that um, that I think will matches to me a lot most. Yeah, well, look, I think I think certainly that what you know you've described for us today and you know tonight, um, <clears throat> this is incredible resource resource you're leaving for a, for another generation, which is you know this this all this you know knowledge of artisanal skill, trying to create that intergenerational continuity between skills that might have been dying out. Um, I mean, to me, that's an incredible legacy to, to, to pass on. Um, it's something to be super proud of. Great. Thank you for having me today. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for joining us. Um, and, and thank you, Thomas. Um, I think I'm going to call Paul back on. Is that right? Um, <laughs> where's Paul? Let's see. I'm going to check my running sheet. Um, Hey, Paul. Oh, hi there. How are you? Hello. Hi, thank you both. That was uh, really, really interesting. And uh, I sort of uh, thinking about um, your, your theatre um, in, in Hong Kong and the, um, uh, and, and the Pritzker Prize winner um, and, and the sort of to uh, Palais de Tokyo in Paris that I know you're fond of. Um, presumably, you were very pleased to see Lacaton Vassal win the, uh, the Pritzker Prize yesterday. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 that's great. So when will the theatre reopen? Sorry, I, I think I missed that. that um... Um, the theatre will reopen around 20, late 2025, early 2026. Right, right, fantastic. Very, very exciting. Well, look, thank you, um, the two Adrians, very much indeed. It, it, it's been a fantastic discussion. Thank you, um, Thomas, for joining us and all the other um, RCA alums and uh, current students. Fantastic to have you all um, join us today. And uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in real time, in yeah. real life, um, you know, either in London or in Hong Kong uh, when, uh, when we're all vaccinated. So thanks Great. very thank much you. indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Bye thank then. you for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye.